Hello, my lovely little darling angels. How are we all doing today? Please don't answer that, because I can't hear you. See if you've just answered that out loud. Let's actually go through the process of what's just happened. You've just out loud answered a pre-recorded podcast from about a week ago. I genuinely recorded this like a week ago. And it's out just now. I know you think, oh, he's speaking to me live. That's not what's happening. Are you alright? Is it is everything alright? No, actually, you know what? Who am I to judge? Who am I to judge? See if you want to talk away out loud to, to me. Feel free. This podcast is actually going on YouTube, so if you are listening on YouTube, then feel free to comment. Let me know what's going on in your life. What's happening? Just don't make it too heavy because I'm not qualified to deal with it. All I'm qualified to do is listen. So actually, you know what? Tell me what you want, but don't expect a response. Just expect me to hear you, and I will hear you. I will make sure that you feel heard. If it's the last thing I do, you will be heard, alright? Sorry, I feel like we got a bit off track there. But welcome back to another episode of Radical Radio Scotland. So if you're new here, then let me tell you a little bit about this project. This podcast was established to platform local activists, campaigners, people of interest, just to kind of analyse what's going on in Scotland and around the world through a leftist lens. Now, I don't know about you, but I do feel like there's a few kind of political podcasts out there where it's just folk talking amongst themselves or to the same politicians who get airtime on the news constantly. Now look, I'm not slagging that premise. If that's your thing, then go for it. But I do want to do things a little bit differently and kind of help amplify the voices of those that are involved in organising a new world. This is a place where you can come and hear the voices of those making their communities, their country and their world a better place. Now, if you think that you'd be a good fit on here, or you know someone who is, then just send me a wee email. It's RadicalRadioScotland at ProtonMail.com Now, what a stupendously amazing conversation I have for all of you today. So this chat was with the one and only Henry Bell. Now, I must say at this point, right... I forgot to mention this to him during the podcast, but his Twitter bio is one of the best I've ever seen. His bio is, the bell that's never rang. I mean, come on. Come on. Is that not just top tier stuff? Unbelievable. But aye, this chat was absolutely eye-opening for me. We spoke about the biography that he's wrote on John McLean. We spoke about poetry. And Henry gave me such a fascinating insight into the situation in Palestine. Right, there was like genuinely parts of this conversation where I was just speechless listening to his testimony. It was unbelievable. I, I could, actually just couldn't believe what I was hearing. So I, honestly, I would absolutely encourage everybody to go out there, get his books, get his poetry, and just absorb yourselves in the words of one of Scotland's most amazing humans. Henry's also got a wee exhibition on the go at Sogo and Salt Market. Sorry, I didn't mean to make that sound pure. <laughs> You're condescending. Oh, he's got a wee exhibition on. Not like he's got a full scale exhibition on at Sogo and the Salt Market in Glasgow, which is all about life and lockdown. So please do go visit that as well. Now, look, before we jump into the wonderful words of Henry Bell, won't you please consider supporting the little podcast that we have on the go here? The easiest and cheapest way to do this is to take your wee gorgeous fingers and tap five stars on whatever podcast and platform you're listening to us on. Now, if you do wish to support us monetarily, then you can obviously donate to us through PayPal or you can check out our Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash Radical Radio Scotland. Your support keeps this podcast, this whole project, ad-free. I don't want any of these marketers getting their grubby wee fingers into your synapses. They're yours and they deserve to have time off from the constant advertising that we get blasted with so yeah your support helps fight that that's, that's, what, that's just kind of what I'm trying to say you know but with all of that said let's just go listen to some powerful words everybody please put your hands together for Henry Bell so Henry thank you so much for coming on Radical Radio Scotland to chat to us today I really do appreciate it thanks for having us so in uh, 2018, you published a biography of uh, John McLean. I must say, it's genuinely one of the best biographies I've read. And one of the reasons that I found it so good was that when I was getting into politics, I was, I was just like 15, 16, 17, and I didn't really know what to read. So I ended up just reading 
biographies on people of like Che Guevara and stuff like that. And I was always kind of struck with how well researched they were. And when I was reading this book as well, it just kind of took me back to that time because it was just such a well thought out. And even though it's not the longest book in the world, it's like so well researched. I thought it was an amazing biography. And it's mad to think that I've spent so long reading about all of these revolutionaries and stuff in, in Latin America when we have people like John McLean here. So what kind of, what, what inspired you to to write this book? Um, yeah, I guess you may be touching on it there with that idea that we, we kind of look at revolutionaries elsewhere in the world. So I kind of was aware of John McLean ever since I moved to Glasgow um, when I was, yeah, when I was like 19. And he comes up, he comes up in kind of political ways, but also I, I write poetry and, and I kind of was involved a bit in music and he comes up in folk song and in poems like uh, McDermott has poems about him, Eddie Morgan has poems about him, but I had kind of struggled to find actually kind of the substance of what he was about. He kind of has this like mythical quality. And um, and then I moved to the South Side and, it, and it's kind of full of places that he was and his house and places he taught and was arrested and things um and yeah it was just that being on that I just felt like I really wanted to start finding out more about him and um and there's there's a great biography of him by his daughter written um kind of in the mid-20th century but um but it's out of print and a lot more documents have kind of been declassified since since she did that work so I just kind of fired into the archives and the good thing about writing about someone that was um tailed by the secret police for their whole life is there's just a lot of material to yeah. get through. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So um, could you tell us a bit about why you think that John McLean is an important historical figure for the Scottish left? Yeah, I think uh, I think he's important in a lot of ways. I think, um, I think one of the things I found kind of most striking about really spending a, a couple of years with his work and his life was how um, how the issues that he was dealing with, particularly at the end of his life, are just the absolute key issues. Now, the the kind of three things he was focused on were um, were like the hours of the working day, the like the right to work, but the right to limits to work, um, the kind of right to secure housing, and the threat of the rising far right. Those were the three things that in in the nineteen twenties he saw as the kind of key front for the left, and I think. Obviously, in Scotland today, that those are the three issues I think that we need to be to be really focused on. Um, the other thing that I think is really important about Maclean and that I, I would like to see you know, more focused on is is the educational aspect of his life, like his his real belief that um, that it's ignorance that that allows this system to perpetuate, and that if people could understand their material condition and like how how economics really is the basis of the oppression of the working class um then liberation is possible and and i think his kind of like total commitment to that the kind of extent to which he ran class after class after class and like traveled the country and even you know on the on the centenary of his birth in the 1960s there were kind of articles written about him then uh, and in that, there are interviews with like elderly miners in Stirlingshire and the Lothians and Fife who remember Maclean's lectures on Marx and stuff. And like the idea that that legacy has, is so far reaching to just get people to properly study and engage with these ideas. Yeah, I think that's that's a thing for me that I'm really into about Maclean. Yeah. I, I mean, I would say that he was ahead of his time in this, but like Glasgow was such a hotbed for kind of radical politics at that time. And it, it's just it's kind of shocking to see that all the issues that these people cared about, even like talking about Mary Barber with the rent strikes and stuff like that, like a hundred years later, we're still we're still battling the same things. I think one of the things that was notable about John McLean as well was like his opposition to the war, which was quite outspoken for his time. But it feels like even just now, there's kind of this hysteria around Ukraine and and Russia and what's happening with that. I mean, I, I know it's certainly more prevalent in the US, but definitely feels like public opinion is that the country should be doing something. And it does feel kind of a bit taboo 
outside of leftist circles to be like, there just there should be no kind of interventions in this kind of stuff at all. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I I thought a lot about McLean's response to the First World War in recent weeks. Like um like there's a thing. So at the at the very outbreak of the war, he was he was one of the few socialists in Scotland that really outspokenly came out against the war. A lot of a lot of the Labour Party and uh and other socialist factions, like the British Socialist Party, came out in support of the war. And even British Socialist Party ordered the paid Scottish organizers to start recruiting for the war, which McLean obviously objected to. But um, but yeah, what he wrote at the time was that people are kind of expecting us to to hate Germans and to hate the German soldiers or German workers. And obviously we should never hate other workers, but also we shouldn't be at war with the German ruling class. That's the German workers job. We need, our first duty is to be at war with our ruling class. And I think, yeah, and a lot of the kind of liberal chat about Ukraine, which has been kind of bewildering to see kind of, yeah, how warmongering uh, liberals can become about these things. Um, like, of course, the Russian ruling class uh, is abhorrent. And of course, what they're doing is abhorrent. But so is our ruling class. And they obviously, on both sides, stand to gain from a prolonged war that they can sell their weapons to both sides. And that's, that's their objective. And so, um, yeah, uh, McLean thought that we needed to have a revolution to end the war. And I think, you know, that's mm-hmm. still that's still the case, isn't it? Yeah. We're just talking about the different ruling classes. It doesn't feel it's like there isn't not really much distinction between the Russian ruling class and the British ruling class anymore. They kind of seem to be amalgamating, certainly over the past few years, with the Tories taking loads of donations from Russian oligarchs and stuff like that. But one of the things that I can I didn't really know about John McLean until I was reading the biography that you wrote was how he was he came from well his parents came from the Highlands and they were cleared from the land. So I was just kind of wondering if you could speak a bit about the the kind of role that the Highland clearances played in the development of John McLean and how these kind of issues are still relevant today. Yeah, I think um, I think that was kind of a huge part of his radicalization. Really, he he, um, although there's no evidence that he was a, a Gaelic speaker himself. Definitely, uh, his mother and his grandmother who brought him up were Gaelic speakers, and he used the pseudonym Gale when he was writing. Um, so he felt this this strong link, and he he definitely kind of heard stories of the clearances. And there's a there's a bit in Volume One of Capital where Marx um, discusses the uh, the Sutherland clearance. Um, and kind of uses it as an example of how the proletariat is created by this initial kind of destruction of kinship and link to subsistence. Um, so I think there's something in that about how he kind of came across his own story in, you know, early in the works of Marx and could like instantly see the power. And so he kind of kept trying to draw that out and trying to tell people that this isn't like some abstract uh, economic theory. This is the the real description of their lives. Kind of as it went on for him, I think it's quite conflicted his his relationship to the clearances. He kind of he introduces this idea of clan communism and kind of um, kind of forward to communism, but back to communism as well. And a, a kind of idea that um, that a restoration of a, a kind of clan system and shared ownership of land and something that he kind of idealizes as a as a Gallic Highland way of life is a model for a future society, which I think there's kind of really interesting things to look at and discuss there. But I think it's also always a dangerous line that kind of, um, that on the one hand makes assumptions about, um, about pre-capitalist life and tribal life that, that are often more idealistic than they are realistic. And also I think it, um, kind of lends itself or it sails dangerously close to a kind of romantic nationalism um, that I think is a, is a big criticism of McLean. I think there's a lot of power in his nationalism that's positive. And I think it, his nationalism was always subordinate to his socialism. Like he always viewed it as a step on the way to the destruction of nations rather than like Scottish independence as an end in itself. Um, but yeah, in that kind of romantic idea of uh, a return to the Highlands, there's something useful but also something a bit problematic I think. Yeah no I know what you mean because I was speaking to Mishnik 
the other day there who have this radical plan for Gaelic communities. And I found a lot of what they were saying to be kind of similar to what John McLean was kind of wanting with this. Well, not like clan con communism, not going that far back, but they were kind of wanting to, you know, just plan the economy, the, the, rural, the rural economy much better to make sure that these kind of Gaelic communities are, are preserved. But I definitely think that he's such a such an interesting historical figure that doesn't get nearly enough attention, not just to him as a person, but to these kind of ideas. I mean, I don't know what you're saying in regards to like, it does flirt dangerously close with kind of romantic nationalism and stuff like that. But I think at the same time, these kind of ideas are worth debating. How do we move forward and take what we can from the past whilst also leaving the negative parts, parts behind. Yeah, definitely. And, and also, how do we kind of interact with ideas of Scottish nationalism? Like, I think that's the other fascinating thing about McLean is, is he's kind of the first, the first major figure to, to come out for Scottish independence, really, you know, ahead of, ahead of what became the SNP, um, you know, and beyond, you know, obviously the Labour Party had discussed home rule, but this was kind of a next step beyond that. And still, that's a thing that I think the left hasn't got a successful position on. I think that we're still, we're still obviously divided on it. It's obviously an issue that people on the left have a unionist position or a nationalist position to some extent. But it's also something where I feel like, in many ways, the the British Communist Party was able to kind of um, utilize distinct uh, Scottish communism and distinct ideas of Scottishness in a kind of in a kind of safe way that no longer exists for that kind of left anymore. We we don't have a good answer to people that say, well, Scotland has been voting left and has voted left and voted left parties and it's been run into the ground. Well, yeah, we need to we need to have an answer. And McLean did have an answer to that, you know. His his answer was that um that Dublin and Edinburgh and Glasgow should never take orders from London. And I, you know, I think that's it's a fair position. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. It is such an interesting thing that there's so many different kind of factions that make up the pro-independence camp. I know that for me personally, the only reason that I supported independence, I mean, it wasn't really from a nationalist position. It was just I wanted to see the decentralisation, you know, the kind of breakup of this power structure that is the UK. And I think that probably once we have independence, we shouldn't stop there. That power shouldn't be centralised in Edinburgh and it should kind of continue and snowball. And it, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, yeah, like back to kind of rural Gallic communities, like they they know best how they should be planning their economy and, and planning yeah. uh, their lives and housing and stuff. Um, I think that's definitely true. Yeah, I think for me, the kind of 2014 feels like a different world, really. It was like, obviously, I, I support independence chiefly kind of similarly to you as like a, a, a blow against the British Empire essentially uh, mm -hmm. that's the key thing that it it would destroy certain ideas of Britishness that are poisonous and also you know Trident is a is a huge element yeah. not just in the like, literal terms of living in a city where there are nuclear weapons on your river but also the bigger idea of how Britain's able to project power through its nuclear arsenal and where if we could somehow get rid of that i think obviously the world would be a safer place in a lot of ways but at the time i also think i thought that um that nationalism could maybe be utilized that like it could be instrumental in spreading a, a radical message that you know it's you can get people behind a solitaire and then you can get talking to them about workers rights and about housing and about redistribution of land and these things and I kind of feel in the nearly 10 years since then that that didn't really happen. I think we I think we led a lot of left wing people to the Saltire rather than bringing a lot of nationalist people to the red flag. Maybe I don't know if, if that's how other people involved in that campaign feel, but that's definitely kind of how it looks to me. No, I would agree with that. I would agree with that because obviously after the independence referendum, you had this massive kind of upsurge and SNP support that's kind of continued at a, a steady level at least uh, uh, 
through voting and stuff like that. But I don't know. I also had this kind of experience after the independence referendum where I live, so I live in Eastern Bartonshire and we all had different kind of yes groups in each town. And after independence didn't happen, we all met in Lennox Town Town Hall and we had kind of discussions about what we wanted independence for. Why did we want it? Because we wanted it to have the power to change these issues. So we started like drawing up all of these different different issues that we wanted to change. And then we all broke off into groups and each group took a different issue. And then, so for example, the group I was part of was an anti-fracking group and each kind of member was from a different town in Eastern Bartonshire. So we all went back from this meeting into our own communities and started anti-fracking campaigns. So then we had this kind of, this broad base over the kind of the whole area where each town had their different anti-fracking groups and it, <clears throat> sorry, and it just kind of s- snowballed out, out from there. And then obviously anti-fracking, like fracking got banned in Scotland shortly after that because all of these little communities had such a massive outreach. So I, I do know what you mean in, in regards to, it does feel like a lot of people did just kind of pick up the saltire. But at the same time, like being we like parts of we projects like that, it was, I think it was called the I two group. There was loads of different, like we kind of still could have harnessed that momentum mm-hmm. a bit better, and it did did feel like as time went on, the numbers of the groups did dwindle, and it was hard to kind of keep that momentum going. I think maybe the anti fracking campaign was probably the most successful one that came out of that, because I don't really. I can't really remember any other ones that we got from that, but no, but that's amazing though. And I think, yeah, that like that mass political engagement uh, in, in kind of 2013, 2014 is, is kind of hard to, hard to like call to mind now that, that really, yeah. in, in, in every town and village, there were people meeting up and discussing what they wanted a political future to look like. And that, uh, that did unleash a huge amount of energy and, and have some very like exciting results. But but over time, it kind of drifted back into this kind of centralizing liberal, but kind of basically new labor ish SNP position. That, yeah. um, but then, but obviously, those people are still there and they still had that experience. And like, to what extent people in the SNP and SNP voters are socialist or left have ideas that are kind of beyond what their party represents? Like, it's obviously. A question up for debate. Yeah, I don't really engage with the SNP membership. I don't know. I don't know how they're divided on these issues. No, so, me neither. I feel like they've changed so much. I remember, like, I didn't even realise that they changed their position on NATO until not long ago. I'd still considered them being against NATO for at least during an independence referendum. I had no idea they changed it in twenty eleven. Mm. It does seem yeah, like the SNP yeah. have become like an increasingly neoliberal project. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like, yeah, economically, militarily, like what do they what do they actually offer as an alternative? Um and that's where a lot of the kind of wished for indie stuff comes in that, that people are like, well, we'll we'll push for these things after independence, after independence. But if the if the ruling party after independence were the SNP, it's hard to see that actually that much would change. Mm-hmm. We do kind of hope that the SNP don't really have a reason to exist anymore after independence, because they do seem like such a broad church. Like you said, there's all these different factions. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and it's hard to imagine how a... Yeah, I don't know whether a, a left electoral force is, is something that um, that kind of falls within your political worldview, but I definitely think that, that it seems so extraordinary and such a shame that there's there just is no electoral left to really speak of at the minute in Scotland and kind of yeah. obviously the conditions were very different in kind of the early years of the century but the the idea that the SSP could emerge out of the kind of 
rubble of the Iraq war and, and the poll tax movement and things and, and have representation for radical socialists in Holyrood seems much more than uh, 15 years old as an idea, doesn't it? It feels yeah. like another world. Yeah. Well, I th- I th- there's definitely a place for it. I don't think that there's going to be one solution to all of all of these ills. But you are right. It's kind of it's almost embarrassing, really, that we're 100 years on and we've still got the same issues, but we're somehow in a weaker position. So, but I do feel like- the, thing that, the thing that I find encouraging about that is that, like, obviously... You know, the west of Scotland has has this reputation as a as a radical and, and socialist place and a place where Marxism kind of took hold in a way that it didn't in other parts of the country. But um but prior to the First World War, that wasn't the reputation at all of uh, of Glasgow and the West of Scotland. The reputation was of a, a profoundly liberal place that still elected only liberals or conservatives that had the lowest trade union membership in, in any industrial centre in the British Isles um, and you know like in in McLean's early diaries when he's organizing with the the uh, SDF the Social Democratic Federation um, he's delighted if they get 20 people to a meeting you know that's considered yeah. to be a real, a real triumph for organizing um, and just you know through the kind of conditions of Glasgow being this massive industrial center for the first world war and the way that thrust it into the kind of limelight politically and economically, it suddenly radicalizes the city to the extent that you have, you know, tens of thousands of people willing to take part in illegal strike action and to take direct political strikes like um, like with Mary Barber and the rent strike, um, and then build, you know, huge political parties like the Independent Labour Party and the Communist Party, both of which uh, were kind of massively centered on Glasgow. Um, yeah, so like, you know, in a way, it's 100 years later and we're in a in a worse position on the left but in another way we've come from further behind in the past yeah no you're right and i do think as well that obviously like you said it was kind of a victory to get 20 people at a i mean i do kind of feel like that's where we're at just now i've had meetings where we've, we've had that kind of turnout and you're like right cool we're, we're getting somewhere but um also at the same time i do see a lot i feel like Glasgow's becoming almost a hotbed for trade unionism again, especially around the the hospitality sector. It, they seem to be really strong in Glasgow just now, and especially like I've noticed their kind of solidarity as well is also kind of growing, and they're kind of building this common base. So I've seen loads of folk that are part of the hospitality industry and unionised, then going to support you know the workers in PO ferries just now at the different ports so whilst it does kind of present itself as we are kind of far behind in terms of electoral politics there's also there's other fronts where I feel like momentum is picking up yeah 100% I think the the work that yeah Better Than Zero and other trade unionists organising in hospitality have done in the city is amazing and it really kind of it doesn't just have like a practical impact on workers yeah it spreads like as just a, an understanding of what solidarity is and like how how that can be life-changing and the same with living rent i think living rent rents work is obviously great on specific campaigns but also what it does to make people feel like they're part of a union is um mm-hmm. it's huge I, I stay on kenmuir street in pollock shields um where obviously you know uh last year there was the the deportation on Eid of my neighbours um, that we stopped. And um, and l- literally the first, you know, well, the, the first people out were people through Unity and people um, kind of directly in our flats. But within 10 minutes or so, it was living rent people and organisers because they had the network and the WhatsApp in the community yeah. to get to, to people in Pollock Shields. And there was, you know, when it was just 10, 15 people in the street, that was, that was one of the networks that had got people out. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's all really encouraging. Like the kind of, and just maybe just an understanding again of what unions are for that I think maybe was a bit lost. But it brings us back also to the kind of toothlessness of the Scottish political class that that we still labour under trade union laws that are incredibly reactionary, 
conservative Westminster laws that, you know, the, uh, that there was the opportunity to devolve Labour law to the Scottish Parliament and it wasn't taken. And also there are things the Scottish Parliament could do to, to support trade unionism that it doesn't do. Yeah. I think, was it not told Tony Blair that boasted we've got the strictest trade union laws in the world? Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. Unbelievable. And I mean, yeah, the, the fact that put striking in solidarity isn't, isn't legal is is a is a sin and like a real issue. I, I've, you know, obviously next week, um, Glasgow council workers are on strike again over equal pay. And I think one of the most inspiring things I've seen in recent years was when they were on strike a few years ago and the um, cleansing workers came out in solidarity. And I think, you know, a, a solidarity cleansing worker strike is such an inspiring thing to see because it affects, you know, it's a visible thing in the city that affects yeah. everyone. Um, and it was something everyone supported as well, yeah. everyone I spoke to anyway. Yeah. And the cleansing workers as well have been incredibly active with trade unionism just now as well. I think actually that's pretty much how I, how I found out about the cleansing workers being really active just now was through living rent, like you said. I, I attended one of their, a demo that they'd done together where they turned up outside Glasgow City Chambers and just dumped a massive pile of rubbish. So, yeah, no, it's great seeing um, seeing living rent build those connections between yeah communities and and the workers that that look after those communities is is really really great yeah and it was you know seeing the cleansing workers win in the end as well to get hmm. the the better conditions the extra staff because um, the more you know the more victories you get to witness the same with the out of Kenmuir Street you know on the left we don't necessarily get so many victories but but when you do it's such an inspiring and it just builds so much momentum doesn't it to see people win yeah definitely definitely so moving on a bit from John McLean and trade unionism and stuff you're the editor of an award-winning magazine called Gutter could you tell us a bit about that yeah sure um so yeah Gutter magazine is uh a magazine of new poetry and prose that comes out twice a year. Um, it's been published since 2009, so we've been, been around a wee while, and it's um, yeah, it's a real joy to make it. Actually, it's um, it used to be run by a publishing house in Glasgow that kind of collapsed, and out of the uh, kind of pretty unpleasant ruins of that going down, we formed a workers' co-op. Um, the people that made the magazine for that publishers, and we took the magazine over ourselves. Um, so it's a kind of board of eight of us that um, that yeah put it together, and it's it's kind of we solicit work and we interview people, but it's also got open submissions twice a year. So we kind of get about five hundred or so um, people send in their work, mostly from Scotland, but also from around the world, and um, and that's the thing I really really enjoy. It's really exciting to be able to kind of sift through what people are making it's almost it's almost like you get a kind of glimpse of the zeitgeist of the like collective <laughs> subconscious that works see yeah. what people are working on and what's coming up for people and then and then discover new writing and new people that are making exciting things and and every issue you know always publishes people that have never had their work in print anywhere before um which i think is a great thing to be able to do yeah yeah so as a bird is not a stone is that also another poetry uh, publication of yours yeah that's that's a book that um that i edited and brought out in 2014 actually yeah round about the referendum that um that kind of was a, it was a long project that came out of um yeah i guess it, it came out of me getting slightly uh radicalized by friends i guess in that way when when other people are you're part of a political project and other people are interested in something else and you kind of slowly find out about it and have your mind changed. Um, so I had been uh, at the Hetherington occupation at Glasgow Uni. So we occupied the Hetherington Research Club for six months, um, which was uh, a really great experience and also a really terrible experience in lots of ways. I think occupations often are, but it, um, but it kind of formed a really strong bond with various comrades to, to like live and work in this building and run a kind of community center and bar and stuff together. Yeah. Over that time, some of the people there were very involved in Palestinian solidarity, which was something that um, that I'd never engaged with, really, um, I guess, for, for various reasons. Um, but I ended up um, visiting a friend in Palestine through that. And um, 
and it was just this unbelievably profound experience to go to the West Bank and find that all of my assumptions and understandings about the situation there were just completely wrong that um that I kind of yeah I guess I hadn't really examined my own prejudices or thought about what the media was trying to tell me about that um about that occupation and about the conflict there um so yeah I kind of came back from was literally you know I was actually I was working in Jordan so I had just nipped across into Palestine to visit this friend and was there just three days and uh, found it the most totally politically transformative experience, both seeing the brutality of, of apartheid in, in Israel and occupied Palestine, but also um, kind of seeing just how inspiring it is to, to speak with people involved in the resistance there and the Palestinian resistance, you know, across many forms, the, the cultural resistance, the artistic community, but also the armed resistance and the, the fighters there. Um, so I came back to Scotland and was kind of trying to think of what, what I could offer. I didn't feel that I had a great deal to offer to the, the political armed resistance, but I felt that on the cultural side, as a cultural worker, I could engage in that. So I kind of began putting together a plan to, to run an exchange and take um, Scottish writers out to Palestine and Palestinian writers to Scotland um, with the idea that Palestinian writers could come here and kind of share some of that experience that, that I'd had and that Scottish writers would also go and be able to come back and, um, and talk in a different way about that and obviously um, engage with the boycott um, was, mm -hmm. the, was the other thing. And luckily Glasgow City Council is twinned with Bethlehem um, and so kind of bizarrely there was a fund to, to do this. So yeah, so yeah Glasgow Council tax paid for, uh, for the project, which was brilliant. Um, and we took Liz Lockhead, who was the macker at the time, mm -hmm. out to the West Bank and some other poets and, and singers and writers. We spent um, two weeks kind of putting on shows in uh, Hebron and Nablus and Janine in Jerusalem and Ramallah and a meeting with artists out there. And we met with the Palestinian Writers Union and with the House of Poetry um, outside Ramallah. Uh, and what came about that was the idea of this project. So the Bird is Not a Stone is a project that translates 30 Palestinian poets into the languages of Scotland. And it was the first book, um, the first anthology of Palestinian poetry in, in English. Um, wow. Yeah, it, was, it, was a real, it was a real joy to work on and to get to spend time with with kind of amazing passing poets, but also to get to spend time with kind of uh, Scottish writers that we took out who maybe weren't at all engaged in in the conflict or politically, or you know, who re or who went. Or, um, I remember going with one uh, one musician, a rapper actually, who kind of before we went was saying, you know, I really I'm really excited about this, but I, but I also I'm going to make sure that I spend time in Israel and I want to spend time in Tel Aviv and I want to hear, hear bits of this story. And then like on maybe day four or five of the trip was like, okay, some, some stories there aren't two sides to, I can't, I can't ever go to Israel having seen what's happening here until, until Palestine's free. And kind of to see people have that experience was exciting too. Yeah. Oh, sounds like, sounds amazing. Sounds like an amazing project to be part of. So I do have two questions. The first one is, could you tell us a bit more about the occupation with Glasgow City Council? And then the second one is, could you go into a bit more detail about your experience specifically within Palestine? What kind of stuff did you witness? Yeah, um, yeah. so Glasgow City Council's relation to the occupation is an interesting one because on the one hand, there's this great kind of branch of solidarity between uh, the city and Bethlehem. And, I, and I, some great things have come out of that, particularly um, the connection with Ida refugee camp, which is a one of the one of the three major refugee camps in Bethlehem, which houses uh, people who were displaced from 1948 uh, Palestine. So when the Nakba happened and the state of Israel was formed, the the kind of lightning war and ethnic cleansing that went on um, drove people into a camp um, there on the outskirts of Bethlehem called Ida, and they're still living there. And through the twinning, there's obviously the connections with the the. Ida youth who come to Glasgow often for kind of dancing and music and things and they've been frequent tours and then there's obviously Ida Celtic the football team in the camp um, who benefit hugely from connection with the Green Brigade um, and that's funded all kind like not just the football in the camp but all kinds of 
they've got a library they've got a, a community center that the money comes from glasgow for yeah but at the same time the city council um you know has contracts with all kinds of companies that are complicit in the occupation um uh eden springs water um the company that's run actually from from occupied syria from the golan heights um that the council has contracts with um viola who are, are responsible for um building a, a, an apartheid light rail system in occupied jerusalem that, that has stops in in jewish neighborhoods and no stops in palestinian neighborhoods and serves only half the population and is illegal anyway on occupied land um council has contracts with them so you know there's there's this kind of double relationship um and i would love to see politicians from bethlehem i'd love to see a mayor of bethlehem call glasgow out on that and call the city council out and say like you know why are you offering this solidarity while at the same time you're funding our oppressors um but yeah but you know at the same time there's great stuff going on so yeah it's a mix in that regard and um, my my own experiences in palestine um yeah, I guess it's a funny question. I've been been a lot since I first went. I, guess, I don't know, maybe five five times I've gone out, kind of both for work and to visit friends and things. And um, and over that time, you know, it's been an experience of seeing, uh, you know, even in that ten years, just the steady erosion of Palestinian rights and Palestinian opportunities and access to their land and access to water and kind of access to any hopeful solution to the to the to their situation to the occupation um yeah i guess what are things that have been kind of profound visiting the jordan valley is a thing that i found kind of deeply affecting the jordan valley is the kind of fertile strip of land that runs along the river jordan and kind of forms occupied west bank's only external border with jordan but the border itself is is uh completely militarized by the Israelis and the whole of the Jordan Valley is um, is defined as Area C. So I don't know if you know, but the West Bank is divided into three areas by the Oslo Accord. So in, in Area A, you have um, kind of legal, political and military jurisdiction of the Palestinian Authority in theory. In, in practice, obviously, Israel still controls those areas, but to some extent, those areas are administered by Palestinians for themselves. And those are, you know, tiny pockets, the center of Ramallah, the center of Hebron. Well, not the center, which is occupied, but the, the Palestinian area of Hebron. And then you have area B, which is a mix. It's under, you know, Palestinian state authority, but Israeli uh, military authority. And then area C is completely militarily occupied land in which Palestinians have no control over their lives and they don't have a right to build. They don't have they don't have a right to anything and that's kind of some of the most dangerous places to live in the west bank and the jordan valley as the kind of breadbasket of the middle east as the place where if you if you buy israeli produce that's where a lot of it will be grown um is that and when you when you drive down into it what you see first is just these huge huge green uh settlements just growing so much food with access to so much water and then on the edges and among them you see these absolutely uh desolate palestinian villages um often with kind of very makeshift housing often with no access to water at all because the spring that that village will have originally relied upon has been uh seized by a settlement by illegal settlers um who you know wonder about uh openly brandishing machine guns um and occasionally shooting at, at local Palestinians and have the defense of the Israeli army around them. So all the checkpoints are manned by Israeli soldiers. But yeah, so this is the settlers uh, themselves that have these machine guns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The settlers themselves kind of act as skirmish. And I mean, I think that's a, an interesting thing in how it's presented is always as if settlers and settlements are, are a civilian infrastructure in Palestine. And that was definitely a thing that had kind of been that I'd kind of absorbed from from reading about the conflict through our media and the, and the reality is that settlements are completely military institutions as well as civilian ones so like they'll always they'll always be strategically positioned if they can on hilltops or around key resources they'll always be surrounded by armed guards but also the settlers themselves will very often be armed with automatic weapons um and they'll go out um from these settlements and they'll trash the palestinian stuff around them if that you know if you see pictures of olive groves being burnt and things like that it's not usually 
Israeli soldiers that do that, although Israeli soldiers stand by and facilitate it and guard settlers while they do it. Mm -hmm. But it's settlers that go out and make these attacks um, on housing and on farms. Yeah, and so I, I was there and I was in uh, was in a tent with a, with a Palestinian couple. Their house had just been bulldozed for the third time by uh, the Israeli army because, um, because it's Area C. Palestinians aren't allowed to build anything um, on it. But, you know, when a house, uh, when a family has grown bigger and, the, and, you know, their kids want to stay in that community, then they want to build a house on their land. They're not allowed to. Um, and so these houses and often whole villages, if they're not uh, wanted there by the Israeli state, are bulldozed again and again. And so we were in a tent because their house had been bulldozed and um, they were explaining about their life there, about how they have to travel three hours to get water from uh, up near Nablus and bring it back to water the, what crops they had. Um, and how they, you know, have a swimming pool in the settlement that they can see from this from this plot of land. And while we were there, one of their kids came in um, to the tent, like a young lad, I don't know, like 14 maybe. And he had stickers on his arm uh, and they were uh, they were Morrison's stickers because he'd been working in the settlement. Um, work Because often, you know, they can't grow enough food. There's not enough work in the Palestinian communities. So Palestinians will take work in the settlement where they're paid poverty wages to work on the land that's been stolen from them. Um, and the dates he'd been packaging were dates that were being packaged for Morrison's and just oh. the like direct click link to the supermarket that I go to all the time to this. Like, yeah unbelievable situation um yeah and then further you know further further on in the valley we visited um a shepherd and his kids um and that was really emotional he was a really you know really lovely guy but he was explaining to us that in order to get from from where he lives to the primary school that that his kids go to he has to pass through a checkpoint and a, a checkpoint at which palestinians have regularly been shot have been shot and killed um you know, often with claims that they had a knife or had a weapon. And uh, and he was getting too scared to take his kids to school and he didn't feel, you know, he didn't want to leave his land. He didn't want to leave the territory because he knew it would be taken by settlers if he abandoned it. But he also didn't feel like he could deprive his kids of an education. And so he was going to give up. He was going to leave. And um, kind of seeing someone in the middle of that decision to be cleared from their land, you know, to come back to chat about clearances, you know, it's, an incredibly extreme um, thing to see someone forced off their land like that at gunpoint. And while I was there chatting with him, some settlers came by and walked through the, the we were in holding uh, machine guns. And I was really struck because they were speaking French. Um, and it just is, you know, so extraordinary to me that for, for whatever reasons, French people would leave France and come and, uh, and act like this and have, um, have this kind of absurd uh, experience and entitlement to this land. But of course, you know, you need to track back into what the experiences of those French people are that have led them to feel like that as well. You know, it's, a, it's obviously a multi-layered thing of oppressions. Um, and I think that's another element of it that, you know, and to some extent, there's a bit of a live issue about, uh, you know, Palestine and the Palestinian cause being anti-Semitic, but a big element of what Israel is, is us outsourcing our anti-Semitism, is Europe, you know, failing to address its own anti-Semitic violence and so sending that violence out to the Middle East to be someone else's problem. Yeah. Wow. I had no idea that it was as intense as that, that settlers would walk around with machine guns and that. Like like you were saying, I did kind of just consider that it was... a. Uh, the settlers were just kind of the civilian infrastructure and and kind of projects and not that they themselves were militarized to that degree yeah yeah no it's it's and it's extremely sad to see i mean in um in hebron whether it's the very center of hebron that's occupied by a settlement so it's a kind of a large palestinian city you know like i don't know about the size of edinburgh maybe and then if you just imagine that the the Royal Mile and the castle is completely closed, you can't pass through it. If you want to travel across the city, you have to go all the way around it. Mm -hmm. And I think there's there's only a uh, hundred or so settlers that live in the they kind of occupy the whole centre of the city, but they just live in a few houses and they're guarded by several thousand Israeli soldiers. Um, wow. So it's kind of this extraordinary fortress in the middle. But when I've been there and I've been in Palestinians' houses 
that uh, you know literally share walls with the settlement that you can look out of their top bedroom windows down into the settlement streets and you see these children playing football there these these we Israeli kids uh, and you just think that their whole life is them surrounded by barbed wire and guns and a, and a population that is both terrified and wants to destroy them and that's a choice that their parents have made, you know, to, to put them there and bring them up like that. That's just totally, totally bewildering to me. Yeah. That is, that's honestly one of the most bizarre decisions that you could ever make. But I think it was interesting as well that you were talking about how these settlers were speaking French. What do you think? I mean, obviously it's hard to dissect why somebody would do that, but was that, was that the only instance where you would hear kind of European languages? Within, within Palestine and, and the settlements? Um, to be honest, that's that's probably my only interaction with, with settlements where with settlers where I've um, kind of been close enough to hear settlers speak. I kind of yeah. I haven't visited or gone into settlements and like to some extent, I think it would be really interesting too, but my experience has always been that I've been staying with Palestinian friends and I've been staying in refugee camps and I think it would be it would be really disrespectful to kind of to go and and, and yeah. visit a settlement and, and kind of make those connections. I don't think you know, I don't think it would be wrong to. I think there's lots that could be learned. I think from trying to understand what the settlers are doing. But yeah, I mean, the settler population comes um, kind of from across Israeli society, but also from the wider diaspora and often from the kind of most vulnerable people. Like often. Um, it's people that have the least opportunity within Israel that choose to live in settlements, partly because you get free land, partly because you get free electric and water, and partly because some organizations pay settlers, you know, particularly organizations abroad, uh, kind of linked to Zionism, but even evangelical Christianity fund um, some of these things that are a kind of a larger white supremacist project. And, um, and so, you know, uh, Russian Jews that arrived in Israel as refugees, you know, Yemeni and Iraqi Jews that were cleared from their country after the Israeli Arab War. Uh, it's often those people that are in that situation and they're, they're obviously they're in the position of oppressors, but they're also pawns of the state. They're also, you know, being being yeah. used. Yeah, so it's a complicated thing. Um, but no, it's not one that I know a huge amount about. Yeah. I think it, what came up, What's amazing about that, though, is that you've went there and had these kind of profound and horrible experiences and managed to turn this into something fruitful where you've got people from Palestine coming over to Scotland to learn about here, share poetry and stuff like that, and obviously vice versa, people from Scotland going over to learn more about that. That's definitely, sounds like an amazing project, and I'd love to. I'm definitely going to read more about that. Yeah, yeah, no, it was really, it was a really great thing to have the chance to work on. And there's kind of been other things that have come out of it since bringing uh, Palestinian theatre companies and artists to Scotland. And there's there's just a really strong uh, tradition here of, of kind of supporting uh, Palestinians to come to Scotland. And, and you know, every year yeah. at the front of Edinburgh, there tend to be Palestinian groups performing and things like that. Um, and, and I mean, that's another thing that was so extreme to me. It's the level of hospitality that you experience in Palestine is unbelievable. Like you can hardly walk down the street without being invited in for some huge lunch with someone or like mm -hmm. to sit in their garden and drink tea and chat. And um, and so whenever I, I know that there are uh, Palestinians visiting, I'm always keen that as many of us as possible kind of extend that welcome and try and invite people in and try and chat to people because because uh, you just you wouldn't believe the level to which you get um, looked after by by Palestinians and how natural that is to to the culture you know across the Middle East but it's, it makes us look like cold bastards to be <laughs> honest. Yeah. The other thing that was funny about that was particularly visiting in those years before and during the independence referendum, Palestinians followed that very closely. They were very very interested in. Um, in Scotland's questions of statehood, Palestine's always been very engaged in in the Irish question. There's like obviously a lot of links between republicanism and the Palestinian resistance. Um, and kind of yeah, by virtue of that, I think they were very interested in Scotland. But after the vote, I do remember being uh, in uh, We Town Beit Amar and someone coming up to us when they found out we were a Scottish group and saying, uh, 
can you explain to me why your country voted not to be free? <laughs> I wasn't, wasn't I able to. <laughs> yeah, that must be so... I'd like, yeah, it's just... They would, they would honestly love just to be able to do that with a vote. And here we are. No, no bloodshed over it, but still be like, nah. Yeah. So you are talking about how there was a kind of history of Palestinians coming over to Scotland and performing theatre and stuff like that. And you were saying that, I don't know if you personally had a hand in some of that, but was any of that to do with the workers' theatre? Um, no, the workers' theatre hasn't been involved in that, although it kind of has definite aspirations to be a, a kind of internationalist project. Um, but yeah, kind of, yeah, connected to that was um, kind of years ago, a kind of group of cultural workers and people working in Theatre Scotland came together um, to found a cooperative theatre company with a kind of kind of pie in the sky aim to run a radical theatre in Scotland at some point, kind of we were a mix of kind of people that worked front of house, people who worked in, in programming and production and PR, but also writing and performing. Um, and kind of had all at various times had experiences of how badly workers are treated. And that like, essentially, uh, the person that runs a theatre at the end of the day is a landlord. That's, <laughs> that's what their position is. They're, they're a very like, you know, well subsidised uh, landlord. They're often, you know, a trust or a charity, but what what they're doing is is related to landlordism. So the idea was that a workers' theatre could run a theatre by and for um, its stuff and 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 share the labour and make radical work, which also kind of comes down to another thing that kind of links to to the McLean stuff and kind of being being really kind of uh, engaged in that time period was that one of the things the left had to offer particularly kind of after McLean's life, particularly in the 20s and 30s, was just huge infrastructure, was just genuine benefit to people's lives. You know, sports associations, amateur dramatic clubs, holiday camps, you know, uh, Red Sunday schools, socialist Sunday schools, all these um, things that really showed people what... uh, what the point of community organizing and solidarity and standing together was, was that you were able to like improve people's lot immediately, not in some kind of idealized future way, but literally to build the things that communities wanted together. Um, And so I I think another thing was that the workers theater was a kind of a a place to discuss uh, having space and providing things and, and providing entertainment and a creative outlet and, and workshops and stuff to people uh in a way that shows you know what that the, that the left isn't just uh meetings in which people with beards shout at you that actually there's other things that we have to offer um it's been a bit paused since the start of the pandemic kind of just before the pandemic we, we did a festival um that i absolutely loved yeah february 2020 the workers theater put on kind of 30 or 40 shows across uh the south side of glasgow kids shows comedy theater discussions um we had a uh, transylvanian kaylee in pollock shores at the borough hall that was brilliant with a a, a great band uh, a roma band from govan hill um with loads of dancing um but we also kind of had discussions um it was a discussion i went to actually that was um pollock shores living rent were hosting it um that was a uh, about gentrification, about gentrification on the South Side and what part the arts play in that and, and how as cultural workers we need to, to guard against how we support and facilitate, you know, landlords and property owners making money out of out of the work when actually the cultural workers don't make money out of the work. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so it's it's kind of a paused project at the minute, I think, but um, but definitely, you know, with things opening back up and stuff, I'd really like to, to be putting on more more radical work for sure yeah so kind of going back to the, the poetry theme could you tell us a bit about the the Clyde Belt poetry apprenticeship yeah sure um yeah that's it that's a great thing that was a really like uh really kind of provided the opportunity for me to be a writer in some ways I think um so yeah there's an organization called St Mungo's Mirable that meet um that meet monthly uh, in the CCA 
and they, it's just a kind of monthly poetry reading and people donate on the door um, to, to come in and they, they bring, you know, it's usually three poets, usually a couple of Scottish poets and they'll bring someone in from Ireland or up from down south or whatever as well. It's got a great programme. And they use the money um, from that to fund um, a poetry apprenticeship. So they so it pays one established poet to have a series of meetings with a group of young poets or kind of aspiring poets uh, over a period of a year, um, and then has a, a showcase at which at which they read um, sometimes a wee publication. Um, yeah, and so I, I kind of applied for that and got that, and and I think. It was it was Jerry Cambridge that year who was the the kind of mentor the poet mentor and um he was really really generous with his time so we met might have been every two weeks I think for a year um to kind of discuss poetry and discuss writing and he'd bring a poem that we'd kind of dissect and then we'd bring what we'd been working on and kind of pull it apart and and I think that kind of approaching writing as a craft is a thing that I really like believe in I think there's like a lot of romanticization about the idea that you know particularly poetry but all writing is something that like certain people can do and it's a thing that's about inspiration or coming to it and I think it's not at all I think it's it's a, like like learning a trade or whatever it's a thing that you mm -hmm. kind of chip away at and slowly by like watching and listening and doing you work out how they things um and I think yeah I think there's a lot of damage done at school in kind of teaching people that poems are like almost like these kind of like riddles to be understood or like pulled apart or whatever rather than a thing that you might do or make yourself to help you understand yeah kind of the world yeah that sounds like a really interesting project when I was reading up on it certainly I really liked the aspect of kind of getting a mentor with a kind of young group of poets as well definitely seems like something that should be funded by yeah by institutions yeah, I think it's a great thing and, and obviously it provides work for older poets as well you know it's a paid job for them mm -hmm. um yeah and it runs every year so like if anyone if you or anyone um has a an urge to write poetry i'd really recommend applying for it yeah so you touched on this a bit earlier but i wanted to kind of go back to it and explore it in more detail could you tell us about the red sunday school yeah so so the red sunday school is a really uh, really new project we're actually running our first proper session this coming Sunday um, at Kinning Park Complex on the 27th of March. But after that, it'll be the last Sunday of every month. And um, yeah, I'm really, really excited about it. It's it's a kind of uh, a long-term project. It's a group of us um, that have kind of came together, first of all, just to kind of talk about the history of socialist Sunday schools in the city. So from the 1890s onwards, um, Glasgow was kind of the centre of, of the socialist Sunday school movement. So uh, it was almost a, a kind of attempt to build that um, that left infrastructure, like I mentioned earlier. I think there was a lot of um, trade unionists and socialists and anarchists in the city who felt that uh, all the institutions were controlled by the church and that particularly children were, through religious Sunday schools, being exposed to uh, reactionary and conservative ideas that are a very impressionable age. And so they wanted to provide a space that both provided childcare. Um, that's like a, a crucial element of it. That's why the religious Sunday schools are so popular because people need to work and they need free time. And so they put the kids in them. Um, so it would provide childcare, but it was also provide a space for um, kind of radical education and critical ideas for kids. Um, and kind of by, by the 1920s and 30s, I think there was um, some estimates put it at about 10,000 kids uh, across the country regularly attended socialist Sunday school meetings um, oh. and kind of a whole generation of, of uh, trade unionists and activists and politicians came up through that people like Paddy Dolan and Jenny Lee who founded the Open University and stuff attended socialist Sunday schools as kids um, and obviously they were like as varied as the movement always is there was uh, kind of quite kind of doctrinaire socially conservative schools in which kids kind of learned by rote ideas about uh, cooperatives and marxism and then they would have um like 10 commandments uh, but kind of 10 socialist commandments to learn off by heart and they'd learn songs and sing together but they're also kind of more extreme radical schools and the proletarian sunday school is the one that our group kind of particularly draws inspiration from which was run in govan hill um from the 1910s to the 1940s by Tom Anderson, who was a guy 
incredible guy who went by the name Comrade Tom. Everyone knew him as Comrade Tom. And he was um, uh, kind of an artist, a writer, an educator, kind of real uh, extraordinary autodidact. And uh, in his school, they uh, they were essentially um, Bolsheviks. They were kind of learning about the Russian Revolution. They were learning about Lenin and, and the Soviets, and they were um, kind of engaged in practical stuff. So to graduate from his school, you had to you had to go out and graffiti a, a Glasgow City Council building with a with a radical slogan to prove that you'd no longer respected authority. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, really cool. So yeah, so kind of taking inspiration from that, we decided we wanted to re-establish a socialist Sunday school in the city, and that's what the Red Sunday School is. So we're going to meet on the last Sunday day of every month, and there's going to be kind of three groups, a kind of play group for under fives, um, uh, a session for five to eight year olds and a session for nine to 12 year olds, and then a kind of communal meal that we'll all eat together. Um, and it'll be, yeah, just a space for kids, I guess, to kind of engage in, in ideas that are different to what they're getting from school and to kind of critically think about the world and think about how they might get to change the world. Um, yeah. Which, yeah, which I, I'm really, really excited about. And I think, also, a lot of parents have already come to us kind of with things that they want their kids to be talking about, you know, um, like a couple of examples. One one local parent here in Park Shields came saying um, that their their kids who are mixed race won't colour in pictures of people brown, that they say it's ugly and stuff, and that she just finds it devastating that six-year-olds yeah. are already internalising ideas about, about ugliness and skin colour and stuff, and that if we could do kind of positive artistic classes talking about race and things and, and, you know, critically engaging with race with kids. And I think that's a really exciting thing to be able to do. And another parent came to us and said that, you know, their, their kid at primary school had just had um, a module called people who help us in which the police come into the school and talk about how, you know, how the police, are your friends and how important police are, mm-hmm. but that that's not their family's experience of the police in our neighborhood and that they would really like a, a more practical and realistic way in which to talk about the police with kids because you don't want to scare kids about the police but you also don't want kids to have the wrong idea that, that the police just yeah. exist as some a fuzzy friendly thing to look out for them um, yeah. rather than one that we're more often than not in conflict with mm-hmm. um so yeah just really yeah really excited and and then in terms of the playgroup thing just uh i'm really keen i've got two small children and myself a two-year-old and a baby um and it's quite, uh, it's not always easy to meet other parents that kind of share share these values and come from this background. And so providing a space where, uh, yeah, comrades that are engaged in parenting can come together and kind of talk about that and talk about how that affects uh, us and what what we want from that for our kids. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, that sounds like an amazing project. Definitely sounds like an amazing project. So one other thing that I wanted to talk about was the, still life um yeah sure um yeah so that's uh, uh an exhibition and a book um that i've been working on kind of the last two years and it's on at the minute um at sogo gallery on the salt market in glasgow um mm-hmm. it's open uh kind of wednesday through sunday and uh yeah i'd love it if people went down to see it it's um it's a project with a woman called angela catlin who is uh just this incredible fascinating photographer that i know um so she like someone should do a kind of retrospective of her work because she's she's made some amazing things she first got a camera um in a project in craig miller where she's from where uh, when you signed on you could either could either get your brew money or you could be given some kind of equipment and so she was given a camera <laughs> from the doll and um and it kind of immediately went about kind of taking and selling photographs and she ended up staffed photographer for the Herald. She covered the troubles for many years. Um, she's been out with the PKK in Kurdistan. She's been oh. photographing Iraq, uh, human smuggling in Burkina Faso. Uh, yeah, just just this incredible, you know, uh, refugee camps in Bangladesh, incredible kind of series of, of photographs and incredible life kind of engaging with these things. But um when the pandemic happened, she was actually in the Congo um, doing uh, some work uh, recording uh, uh, rape survivors and activists who are campaigning against the use of rape by uh, the armies in the war there. 
Um, so she was she was taking those portraits and she decided obviously that she needed to get back to Scotland if there was going to be this kind of extreme unprecedented lockdown. And when she arrived, um, she kind of realised that she wanted to be documenting it to keep herself busy. So she spent the lockdowns uh, kind of photographing the city and photographing the people of the city. And she got in touch with me because she wanted to kind of write an element to that project. So, so I wrote a series of poems and she took these photographs and we'd often like walk through the city together or I'd send her what I was writing. She'd send me what she'd been photographing and we kind of made this project together. That's kind of, yeah, just a, just a document of, of that kind of, you know, it's a cliche to say it, but that, that unprecedented extraordinary time. And, and I, I kind of time that, that I think we'll not see again. And that we've kind of put very far away from us now that the idea that we weren't allowed to leave our houses, you know, that you could only leave the house for an hour a day and that, when you left in that hour, if you saw a friend or saw a neighbor, you, you weren't supposed to cross the street and chat to them. You just kept walking. You couldn't sit at benches. You couldn't sunbathe. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, yeah. it's, uh, the extremity of that now feels feels really distant. And so it's kind of a chance to revisit that. And it's a chance to kind of look at the kind of grief and fear of that time, but also the kind of community and solidarity of that time as well. Like I, I my personal experience of the lockdown on the one hand was you know being locked down with a with an infant 23 hours a day was was a pretty intense experience but also um you know the mutual aid organizations that sprang up in glasgow were incredible we'd like we were running a, a food bank out of govan hill bars we were transporting food parcels across the city kind of working with them um, with recovering addicts getting food out to people in situations like that and stuff and um and the kind of network and the people, the level at which people came together and the kind of like a bit like you were saying about the independence campaign, the the infrastructure that still exists from that, you know, like in, in Park Shields, there's still a community run food point that, that gives out hot meals uh, every day. There's still uh, a kind of new community centre at the Bowling Green that came out of that and stuff. And um, and then obviously, you know, the, the political anger that's spilled out, like I think it's a fascinating thing that when when you do separate people like that, and obviously uh, there are various things that the pandemic really did. One was it gave some people lots more time to like organize and think and, and engage in political ideas. And the other was it, it didn't give people any more time and it, and it showed which workers just had to keep working. And, you know, to some extent it was a lockdown for the middle classes. It wasn't a working class lockdown. Yeah. And, and it really highlighted the extremities of that, that, that pay and conditions does not in any way relate to how necessary people's labor is. And I think things like the Black Lives Matters demonstrations and the Ken Muir Street event and things like that really were things that sprung out of those kind of material realities becoming clearer through it. So it's also, yeah, the poetry and pictures kind of document that side of things as well. Yeah, that sounds amazing. And that's at Sogo and the Salt Market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try and, try and get down if you get a chance. Yeah, yeah. I will, and I encourage everyone to. It sounds sounds really cool, um, but I think that wraps up everything that I wanted to ask you. Have you got anything you want to shout out? Where can people find you? Uh, no, you can't find me anywhere, so that's fine. But um, but I'd like to shout out about the Red Sunday School. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna be meeting on the the last Sunday of every month at Kinning Park Complex in Glasgow, and um, you can find it's Red Sunday School on Twitter and Instagram, and uh, and yeah, if you know any any uh, kids under the age of 12 that you'd like to kind of engage with some radical ideas then pass it on to them yeah will do listen Henry thank you so much that was amazing cheers man really nice to chat to you well everybody that was Henry Bell didn't I tell you that it was a great conversation what a guy honestly yeah check out all of his works his exhibition at Sogo and of course the Red Sunday School thank you so so much for listening and I'll catch you after.